for our second piece of gathering music today, we're going to sing uh, one twelve. We're going to sing number one twelve, which is on Christmas night all Christians sing. For our last, last song of Gathering Music today, we're going to sing number 144, which is In the Bleak Midwinter. Only verses 1 through 4. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning. It's great to have you with us in God's house. 
I'd like to ask you to look around and see if there is somebody seated near you that you've not had the opportunity to greet. Let's stand and introduce ourselves to one another in Christ's love. How are you doing? We saw your crowd here at early service. Yes, As you make your way back to the pew in which you're seated, I hope that you'll pick up the Ritual of Friendship pad. We'd love to know that you were with us today, and so if you pick that up and pass it down, we'd like everyone else to have the opportunity to sign also. As you look in the bulletin, you'll see that we are moving into a wonderful time of the year. Christmas Day is almost upon us. We do on Christmas Day celebrate with our soup kitchen, and we have a number of folks who have volunteered. The sign-up sheets are down on the Deacon's Board in McLeod Hall. I know we've got at least 10 folks that have signed up to help with the cooking prep that day. I think it was growing towards 10 <coughs> folks to help with the serving. But if that's something you would like to do on Christmas Day, it's a wonderful opportunity. And that's downstairs on the board. We'd love to have you sign up. If you signed up to cook a turkey, the turkeys are in the freezer in the kitchen. And on the refrigerator is a little check sheet that you can follow. Let me know that you have your turkey. If you signed up to cook a ham, the hams are in the fridge there. Check that off also. If you didn't sign up to cook either, our menu this year is going to include five turkeys and 15 hams. So the hams are already there. Semi, they're semi, now what are they? They're half hams, semi boneless, and they need to be heated through and dressed up with your dressing. So if you do some type of glaze or something, they're not raw hams, they are cooked, but we need that. If you wanna cook any of those and bring them back, all the instructions are in here and down in the kitchen. We had about five folks that signed up for hams, so there are 10 extra hams down there right now if you were so inclined to help prepare one of those hams. We are hoping that the leftover ham especially will go towards the Saturday after Christmas Day soup kitchen. We will have our traditional soup kitchen on that day. We have a member of the early service who is going to make soup that morning, 150 servings of soup, and we're planning to cut a lot of the leftover ham and do ham sandwiches, soup, and different trimmings there. If you'd like to help on that one, the cooking the soup is covered. Ross Kosminski is going to be overseeing the soup kitchen on the 27th, and he could use some help right now to help him put together sandwiches and serve that day. And that sign up is downstairs also. Christmas Eve is right about here, and we do want to remind you that our Christmas Eve service is 5 o'clock, 9 o'clock. The 5 o'clock service is, has an interactive children's story, so lots of our families gravitate towards that service. But we would love to have you bring your friends, relatives, neighbors, and join us for either 5 or 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve. We almost overlooked three cents a meal in the bulletin. Alan taught that Friday in a proofing session, so it's in here. I don't know if you remember this is the third Sunday of the month because it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, but many of us take up a collection every time we eat a meal at home, put those pennies aside, and bring them in on the third Sunday of the month. We had about 10 helpers at the early service. As I look around today, I'd like to call on any of the children if they would help us take up that collection. I need some folks to come take baskets. There are baskets up in the balcony. So three penny partners, do I have any of the children who are willing to help us collect the three cents a meal hunger offering? I'm seeing Sawyer's gonna come down and he's gonna be a very busy man by himself. Oh good, okay, we've got the Allen kids are coming. If you'd like to come, go ahead and take a basket. There is a, in the pew card, you'll find the three penny partner song and as they come around, you can sing and just wave to them. Oh good, they're coming from all directions now. So if you guys would grab a basket, 
Let us now continue our worship as we present our three cents a meal hunger offering. <coughs> The theme for today, as we light the fourth Advent candle, is love. The scripture is Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a child is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it. With justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let us pray. God of the past, present, and future, we watch and wait for the coming of your kingdom in our world. Help us to eagerly anticipate the birth of love and light that we celebrate each day of this holy season. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. seated. In 1 John we read, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins using the printed prayer of confession found in your bulletin and then let us observe a few moments for silent reflection and confession. Let us pray together. God, with unhurried gentleness, you draw near to us. You bid us to lift our eyes to the infinite stars and the ordinary wonders all around. Yet as we watch the setting sun and the dazzle of holiday lights, we feel that we have seen all this before. It is hard for us to claim a breathless anticipation of the birth of your son. For the Christmas season is familiar, and it seems to hold no surprises. Remind us, though, that your power and love are ancient and ever new. Help us to see afresh the grace born into the world at each moment. Then, with glad hearts, help us to welcome our Savior and Lord 
and all that he brings to our lives at Christmas. Each day you give us in his name. <coughs> O oh God, create in us clean hearts and renew a right spirit within us, we humbly ask. Amen. is in a position to condemn us, only Christ, and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, and even now Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. Behold, a new life has begun. Friends, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Be seated. A popular carol asks, What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him, give my heart. The greatest gift we can give God is our hearts and Yet with all God has given us, we can indeed do our part. As we continue our worship, let us now present God's tithe and our offering. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord God, we have seen how a small offering adds up as it is consistently given over time. For example, our three cents per meal hunger offering. The children have already collected this offering this morning. Along with it, we now present your tithe and other offerings for maintaining your house and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ here and throughout the world. As we do our part, we give our hearts and we offer ourselves for your service. May all of our gifts serve to prosper your church and so advance your kingdom. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the children who are with us to join me down front for our time with younger disciples. How are you all doing today? wonder if anybody knows what's going to happen on Thursday this week. Special day coming, and tell me what day that is. Christmas Day. Does everybody know that Christmas is this week? And on Christmas, you may run into something that looks like this. What is this? It's a present. That's right. Now, I don't know if you've been asking Santa for anything for Christmas, have you? Well, there are some people listening out here today that may need to hear what you've been asking Santa for. So I want everybody to think of one thing you'd like Santa to bring you at Christmas. Can you think of one thing you'd like? Okay, tell me one thing you... A what? A video? No, a Wii U. A Wii U. I had this problem at the early service, too. I don't have small children or grandchildren. It's a Wii U. Is that close? No. <laughs> it's a gaming system. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to do our best. Can you think of one thing you've asked Santa for? Cleats? Okay, I thought I heard that. Cleats. Good. One thing you've asked Santa for, man. A panda bear? Okay. One thing you've asked Santa for. Xbox, okay. A soccer ball, good. And I'll get help from parents on this one, thank you. One thing you've asked Santa for. A train? Okay, Henry. One thing you've asked Santa for. A book, okay. And did one thing you've asked Santa for. A bride? A bike? Oh, okay. So, we're looking forward to gifts at Christmas, aren't we? And it's okay to ask for things at Christmas. And it's okay to give things at Christmas. And I wasn't going to ask you to tell me gifts that you're giving because I don't want any surprises to be ruined today. But at Christmas, I think lots of us give gifts, and lots of us get gifts. And we do that because the wise men brought gifts to the baby Jesus, and at Christmas we think about what gifts God gives us. Now, in this box, it's a mystery, but right here in my pocket... I've got something that says it is the gift of Christmas. And it fell out of my pocket. There we go. It says, this is the true gift of Christmas. You want to know what's in there? What is that? That's a baby, and we say that's the baby Jesus. That's the true gift of Christmas. Well, we won't know that till Christmas Day, but that's the true gift of Christmas. 
When I drive around town, I like watching what churches put on their signs out front. And there's one in town right now that some of you may have driven by. It says, Mary wrapped the first Christmas gift. And that was the baby Jesus. And so I want you to remember that. When you come on Christmas Eve, I want you to look at our nativity set, which is out back, because right now the baby Jesus isn't there yet. But on Christmas Eve, the baby Jesus will be there, and we'll keep talking about baby Jesus is the true gift of Christmas. Well, let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads, and let's talk to God in prayer. God, we thank you for the gifts that we can give at Christmas, and as we're planning to give gifts to people that we love, we ask you to send those gifts with your love. And we thank you for the things that we receive, the toys, the things that help us to enjoy life, and most of all, we thank you for the true gift of Christmas, and that is that Jesus came into the world for us. Thank you, God, for giving us that and for helping us to enjoy the spirit of that gift every single day of the year. Bless us now as we move towards Christmas and help us to have a merry and blessed Christmas in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming today and thanks for coming down to help me. Let us now continue our worship as we offer our prayers as a people. Maker of all things bright and beautiful, we praise you for so many things that capture our attention at this most wonderful time of the year. We thank you for mistletoe with its olive green leathery leaves and cream colored pearls. We thank you for coral, pink and white poinsettias, but red by far are our favorites. We thank you for dark green holly with its bright red berries. We thank you for Christmas cactuses with their many different colored blooms. We thank you for the many shades of evergreen, cedar, fir, juniper, pine, and spruce. We thank you for the brilliant white blossoms of stars of Bethlehem. We are grateful for the beauty we find in nature. Lord of the seasons, today marks the shortest of days, the longest of nights, and the beginning of winter. For us who live in sunny central Florida, it is the height of the harvest season for citrus fruits. It also marks the time when we experience our coolest weather and the falling of leaves. For those who live in states to the north of us, winter brings cold temperatures, frozen precipitation in the form of snow, sleet, or freezing rain, creating icy roads, difficulty traveling, and sometimes power outages. Even though snow can cause problems, a snow-covered landscape is beautiful. By day, the sunlight glistens on the snow, and by night, the moon's glow is reflected by the white landscape. It is a winter wonderland for those who enjoy sledding, sleigh riding, snow skiing, and ice skating. We thank you for the crunching sound as one trudges through snow, for the stillness that can be interrupted by the chattering and chirping of birds, and for the crackling sounds of logs burning in a fireplace. After being outside, it is nice to shed some layers of clothing, to stand by a fireside so as to thaw out, to be warm by hot chocolate, cider, coffee, or tea, and to feel satisfied after eating some chowder, hearty soup, or stew. We thank you for winter and for the particular gifts of this season. Faithful traveling companion, as you were with Mary and Joseph as they made their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, so we ask you to accompany those who are traveling, whether by land, air, or sea. Grant them safe travel as they go to be with family or friends to celebrate the Christmas holidays. Blessed Lord, a popular song tells us that there is no place like home for the holidays. Often home is thought of as a particular place 
Yet the home of that first Christmas meant being with one's loved ones, even though one might be in strange surroundings. We pray for those in our military forces who cannot be home for the holidays because their duties require them to be where they are. We pray for those who are hospitalized or who are confined to health care facilities who cannot go home. We pray for those incarcerated and who have forfeited the pleasure and privilege of being home with family as punishment for their behavior. Comfort all those who feel homesick and who yearn to be in the company of their families and loved ones. God of great compassion, hear our prayers for those who are hurting. We remember those who are addicted, asking you to strengthen their resolve when the holiday stresses seem too much to bear and when they find themselves in the company of those who imbibe and are tempted to join the party. We remember the sick, those who are recovering from injuries or surgery and those undergoing therapies or treatments. Comfort and strengthen them. Grant healing as a sign of your grace and grant your peace to those who are dying. We remember those whose holiday spirit has been overshadowed by grief. We pray for those who mourn, asking you to console their troubled hearts. Grant that as they remember Christ's birth, that they would be reminded because of the incarnation, we need no longer fear the grave, for Christ has come to save. We ask your blessing on the bereaved this day. We ask you to comfort those who are lonely and those who are depressed to fill them with hope. In this season when want is keenly felt, we ask your blessing on those who are hungry, giving you thanks for those engaged in feeding ministries to respond to their need. We pray for those who are in need of safe and warm shelter, grateful for those agencies and organizations who provide such relief and refuge. We pray for all of the poor and needy, asking that they may be made aware of your provision for their needs through the demonstration of those who see them as Christ's brothers or sisters. We pray for our military forces, especially those stationed in dangerous areas of our world, and we pray for all those who labor 24-7 and who may be working on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, unable to be with their families and friends. All these prayers and the silent ones of our hearts we offer in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, and together we pray the family prayer he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts, debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us, us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom power, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture lesson for today comes to us in the gospel according to John. I invite you to turn there in the Bible that you brought from home or the Bible that you'll find in the pew today. I'll be reading today from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. John chapter 1, verse 14. Listen for God's word to us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Christmas time again, and throughout Advent this year, Dr. Harvey and I have focused our preaching on scriptures from the prologue to the Gospel of John. That's the first 18 verses of the first chapter of John's Gospel. Listen, if you will, to how the writer of the fourth Gospel tells us about the birth of Christ in this prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John's an interesting biblical writer. Later in his gospel, way over in chapter 13, when John decides to tell us the story of Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper, he does so without any mention of the bread or the cup. And here in chapter 1 of John's Gospel, he tells the story of the coming of Christ without the part about the shepherds, the angels, or the wise men. In fact, he tells us about the coming of Christ without mentioning Mary or Joseph, and he doesn't even get to the name of Jesus until the second to the last verse of his prologue. But there's no doubt that everything that I read to you now is the story of the coming of Christ. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now there's a reason that John made such huge omissions in his gospel. He assumes that you and I already know the basic story and the details. John was writing in a different way in his gospel. He was writing to fill in the blanks to the story that we already know. John saw the purpose of his gospel as explaining how the presence of Jesus in our lives and world really makes a difference. Now, why would John make such huge assumptions? Because most people believe that John was the last of the gospel writers to create his gospel. If you look at the New Testament, it seems that Mark was the first. Maybe 10 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus, it seems that Mark sat down to tell the story of the importance of Jesus and his life. In Mark's gospel, there is not a birth story for Jesus. Now, when you look at Mark's gospel, in the very first scene, we see an adult John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness about one who is to come to fulfill the promises of God. And as John speaks, a full-grown man, Jesus, the Son of God, appears on the scene. Now, Matthew and Luke probably put their gospels on papyrus a decade after Mark. In fact, Matthew and Luke follow the outline of Mark so closely that many scholars think that Matthew and Luke each had a copy of Mark's gospel in front of them, and what they did was take the basic story and add in details. Luke and Matthew each give us an account of the birth of Jesus. Now Luke tells us the backstory. He tells us about Elizabeth and Zechariah, a very unlikely couple who had a baby they named John. He would grow to be John the Baptist. Luke also tells us about Mary and Joseph, another unlikely couple, and the miraculous way their child came to be, their child, the Savior of the world, the little baby Jesus, who was born in our midst. That's Luke's telling. Matthew connects the story of the birth of Jesus to the Old Testament story. He tells us how the prophecies were coming true in the birth of the Christ child. We see in Matthew that the chief priests and the scribes in Jerusalem point all this out to the wise men and to Herod. Now thanks to the wide circulation of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, people in our day, like people in first century Palestine, knew quite well about angels and shepherds, wise men and a star, Mary, Joseph in a stable, and a little baby in Bethlehem. Building on that foundation of knowledge of the Christmas story, 
John came on the scene 40 or 50 years after the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus to record his understanding of what the person of Jesus meant to us. You see, he doesn't mention Jesus by name until the second to the last verse of his prologue because John knows that we're already filling in the blanks, that we know without a doubt that he's telling us about the birth of the Christ. In him was life, and the life was the light of all humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. From his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who was in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Friends, a baby was born in Bethlehem. And that was proof to the world that God came to dwell among us. No one had ever seen God to that point. But the very heart of God was revealed to us by the only Son who came from the bosom of the Father. Now when John set out to tell that story, he had all types of words available. But when he wanted to tell us about God in the person of God in human flesh, the words he used to describe that person were grace and truth. Truth. That's been defined as some Bible scholars as faithfulness to the promises of God. It's the fulfillment and completion of what our Creator promised us from the very beginning. And grace, grace is redeeming love. In thinking about what happened in a manger in Bethlehem, 50 years after that event, John decided to summarize it in this way. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That's what had been promised to the shepherds. Don't be afraid, I'm bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, and lying in a manger, and suddenly with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praised God and said, Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. You see, these common people from around Bethlehem spending their nights out in the field simply making a living watching the flocks were invited to witness the birth of the Savior of the world. As the song said, God and sinners were reconciled why? How? The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That's also what the wise men were promised. These kings, these astronomers, these scholars from the Orient saw a supernova. They saw a star so bright in the sky that they knew something special had happened. And they made a pilgrimage all the way to see the newborn king. When they found him, they bowed down in obedience. They gave him gifts suited for a king and for a god and a gift for sacrifice. Why? How? Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. That's what the babe of Bethlehem embodied. This was evident to John as he wrote his gospel, as he reflected on the life of Jesus. Grace and truth were the hallmarks of God in human flesh. When we get over to chapter 18 of John's gospel when Jesus is being condemned to death, there's an exchange between Jesus, this grown man, and Pilate, the governor in the region. And in that exchange, we find echoed words from the prologue to John. Pilate said to him, so you're a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice, Pilate said. And Pilate said to Jesus, what is the truth? 
the truth about Jesus revolves around the fact that he was God in human flesh. And as we believe in him, we are the children of God and we have life in his name. And as we know him, we receive grace upon grace. The word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. From his fullness, we've received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. That's the light of the world that overcomes the darkness. As he dwelt among us, he overcame darkness in people's lives with grace and with truth. Listen to one more story as it comes to us in the gospel according to John. In chapter 8, we find a story of how grace walked and talked and lived. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to Jesus to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Once again, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on do not sin again. Again Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God came in human flesh. The light of the world shone in the darkness full of grace and truth. And we have received grace upon grace. Grace. Over the years, that word has grabbed the attention of the children of God. Back in the 1800s, a slave trader who had turned believer named John Newton called the power and the presence of God in his life and our lives an amazing grace. How sweet the sound, he said, to save a wretch like me. Back in the 1900s, one of my favorite authors, a Presbyterian minister named Frederick Beekner, offered this reflection on grace. After centuries of handling and mishandling, Beekner wrote, most religious words have grown so shop-worn, nobody's much interested anymore. Not so with grace for some reason. Mysteriously, even derivatives like gracious and graceful still have some of the bloom left. Grace is something you can never get, but can only be given. There is no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good looks, or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. Have you ever tried to love somebody? A crucial eccentricity of the Christian faith is the assertion that people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. The grace of God means something like, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party would not have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you that I created the universe. 
I love you. That's the grace of God. Friends, the redeeming love of God came into the world as God's greatest gift in a manger in Bethlehem. And it still permeates our lives as we ponder the coming of the Christ child today. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. I don't know what you asked for for Christmas, but that's the Christmas gift that we are all given. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The story of Jesus is told as a birth story, a death story, and a resurrection story. And all of that makes a difference in our lives. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, we find for generations how Christians have affirmed their belief. I invite you to turn to page 35 in your hymn book. Please stand if you're physically able. Let us join together as we respond. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. that you have made great plans to give something special to people around you. Tis the season of receiving, and I hope that you will receive gifts that will bring you joy. And most of all, I hope you will open that gift that God offers freely.
truth and grace as it comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Now as you go out to be givers and receivers, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.